I I kind of I kind of bailed on going up to the hill, and I just I, I didn't I didn't want to be up on the hill that late uh, with the bear still around by myself. So oh, I, just, no. I, I just I just stayed uh, stayed at the end of the driveway with my uh, umbrella, good for you. Uh, sh shielding the uh, light above me. Good good. Yeah, yeah we didn't it see works. any bears. It was it was fine. There was no no bears, no grunting, not even any of those weird deer that make that strange sound so i was gonna say david got home and he had a you know a, a camera on a, a tripod just nearby taking some ground shots and all of a sudden you saw a bear behind it when he was just taking <laughs> photographs it could be anywhere yeah <laughs> not really stick a webcam on your car you could uh do a live broadcast of you being eaten by a bear <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a little distasteful <laughs> Maybe even for the bear. <laughs> Gary's doing some sort of magic. Gary, what are you yeah, that was that's really weird. He kind of vanished back out. He's reappears. <laughs> I'm practicing teleporting. Like invisible cloak. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's working. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> No, this my I my office is also a guest bedroom, so the bed behind me is very messy. So I don't put these pictures here because I like the pictures. It does. I just don't want you to see the mess. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> so good news from uh, John today. He found a focuser for the scope mm. that we already have. Oh, that's gonna be oh, he, he found he found the feather touch. Uh, we were talking about that. He well, oh, we weren't he, sure. Or a helicoid. The helicoid. It's a helicoid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it looks like yeah. it might. Is John here? I don't John, see him here. Yeah, oh, he's rich. Yeah, he's going up there. Just heard him. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Okay, it's a, it's Bruno Quinneville's helical focuser. I I should have remembered this sooner, but uh, we had it briefly on the fourteen inch. And it's it's a beautiful focuser. Uh, it has a lovely scale. You can't see it probably in this. It keeps vanishing into your background. <laughs> but it has a nice scale. You can reset, oh, it, reset it. Oh, yeah. John, John, that looks like um, one of the Borgs. The series. It is a Borg, Borg one. It's a Series 80 uh, Borg uh, helical. It is. Yeah. I love I nice love those focusers. Is. They're really nice. Well, you'll see one tonight on my rig. Actually, you'll you'll see the the Borg helical. It's a it's a slimline helical, but it's a... well. The nice thing about it is that the <coughs> threads are the same size as I'm pretty sure as the ones on the uh, telescope. Good, good. So yeah. it will fit. And Borg also makes this. This one is three and a quarter inches long uh, when it's when it's uh, fully in. They make a very thin one as well. Yeah, very good, John. Yep. There's, there's just... going to be a breaking news PowerPoint on this development, but you've spilled the beans already, I think. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's my fault. I'm so excited. I couldn't wait. I'll just let everyone know I'm recording the meeting. And we'll uh, get started in just a moment. It's just a few people are showing up as we speak, so we'll, uh, we'll just uh, give a few I more have, I have a, a little item for the meeting, so could you throw me on the list? I sure can. Chris, you were named on uh, on CBC. There was a historian about uh, the Canadian space uh, efforts, and she credited you with motivating her. Oh, really? Uh, wow. Was that Elizabeth Howell? Uh, there's a new book about the, uh, the, the space Canada agency Arm. and the Canada Arm. Yes, uh, it's Elizabeth Howell. Uh, and yes, I, you know, I reviewed some of that book. I just saw it in Monroe's today. I was visiting Monroe's today. So that book is available and it's only 22 bucks. So it's a good deal. Um, so yes, uh, uh, it's, uh, I, I am trying to help some of the younger people come up. <laughs> so Chris, you're the expert on Hubble, huh? I'm the expert on Hubble, yes. Unfortunately, I was hoping my book would be out. It's not out yet, but 
it will be, uh, it's being published by NASA, and I hope it'll be out soon. It'll be available as a free download, in addition oh. to, uh, you know, a book oh. that you can purchase. Oh, wow. So, uh, looking forward to it. Yeah, because NASA did it, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not expecting royalties, <laughs> but I was very generously paid while I was writing it. Nice. We got to get you to sign the uh, download. <laughs> Virtual That's right. right. Electronic I, signature. David or Joe could probably help me affix a, a digital signature or something, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure that uh, oh, ebook will be nailed tight. If you won't be able to modify it at all, but we'll, yeah. we'll try. We'll try and do something. But maybe, anyway, maybe, it's, maybe we can it, print it and then you can sign the printed copy. Oh, there yeah, is. there is that. And and, and I hope. Be, because it's a, a government document, it will be a bit more complicated to get the hard copy, you know, like you just can't go to Amazon and get it. Oh. And, and uh, which will be a bit of a problem when you're outside the States, but I'm, I'm hoping to arrange to maybe get a whole bunch that I can, that I can, you know, sell and make available. Good. And because uh, uh, it's, it's it's kind of the history of Hubble operations, and um, you know it's uh, there. You know, one one has to answer a lot of questions in there about you know how things happen and why they happen the way they happened. You know, like why was this instrument replaced on that mission and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I had to get into the science. You know. I have a whole library just just at the end of my arm here of books about Hubble, and I have a number of books about Hubble that say virtually nothing about the science, mm -hmm. because the authors like writing about spacecraft, but they don't understand the science. And I'm not saying that I understood it when I started, but I got a lot of help <laughs> from the folks up on the hill, and and so I was able to, you know, get some idea of you know what what science they were after. Hey, Chris, could I ask uh, Chris first, could I ask Chris Gaynor uh, a question during, uh, right after his presentation? Because I, in the Sierra Vista Astronomy Club that I belong to was the former head of um, satellite spy satellite, uh, the American spy satellite. So I asked him one time about this, about Hubble, and he has quite a story. I'd like Chris's opinion about it, please. But I don't want to take up yeah. time. Now. Okay. Well, maybe we should um, uh, get started now anyways, and uh, welcome everyone to um, another, uh, so our October 26th, pre-Halloween uh, version of uh, Astro Cafe. Um, and welcome everyone. Um, so on the uh, agenda this evening, uh, David Lee uh, has been doing some work with some uh, uh, new telescopes, so he was uh, uh, asked to uh, give us a rundown on that. Um, I believe we have one item from Edmonton. Um, there was an email from one of our members uh, from Up Island, Ed uh, Madsen, that I thought I'd mention just in case for the people who aren't on the uh, RASP VIC list. Uh, Chris Gaynor has something and uh, Reds will have our normal rundown. Um, is there anybody else I've missed? Uh, I'd like to ask the question if, if possible. Sure. A little bit patilica in reference to politics. Okay. <laughs> no politics. No politics. We just survived the election. Well, sure. anyways, maybe I'll just mention Ed's um, email to get started. So um, uh, he um, he is very interested. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, he's very interested in uh, meteors and and related stuff there. And uh, a lot of people know him <laughs> way better than I do. Anyways, but he has a relative who was um, out and about on, um, I guess it was the 25th, which would have been yesterday, uh, uh, in the Lower Mainland, Greater Vancouver, and saw quite a bright um, fireball. And um, it went uh, approximately east to west and then split into two pieces. Didn't hear any sound. Um, so he was wondering about uh, if anybody had seen that. Um, his all sky camera is down at the moment. Um, and I believe um, since there's a meteor breakup and somebody in Vancouver. 
And um, so, uh, you know, did anybody else see that? And so if you weren't on the RASC VIC uh, list, you didn't see that email. So maybe I'll mention that to start with. For your information, I checked my camera. Uh, there was none big event. So there's uh, nothing I could see from Nothing he could site. see from here. No. Nothing. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah, so I just don't know if anybody did see anything, but probably if Sid's camera didn't pick anything up, there probably wasn't anything visible um, here. Okay, uh, maybe we'll just go to uh, Chris Gaynor. Did you, uh, you wanted to say something? Okay, um, and I'm going to, uh, just a minute here. Uh, I, 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 I just I just thought I would uh, bring up something uh, that uh, that happened uh, with involving me today um, and uh, uh, I'm going to uh, put up a, a screen here just a second and uh, so back in June um, at the General Assembly, Bob McDonald spoke at the General Assembly and uh, announced that uh, the proposed uh, moving of the Maritime Museum of BC from uh, its current storefront location on Humboldt Street to Langford uh, included plans that would incorporate a domed theater for uh, uh, a planetaria or a planetarium and um, and I think uh, you know I was quite interested to hear that and I raised that at the time and then basically uh, um, that was the last I heard about it until last week when I was invited to a meeting that took place uh, earlier today uh, between uh, uh, myself uh, 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 David Leverton, the um, the uh, the CEO of the uh, uh, Maritime Museum, and a fellow named Bob McDonald, uh, who I just mentioned, and uh, so anyway, um, he said that they are are very much interested in proceeding uh, with these plans, and and wanted to know about the. RASC's interest in this. So uh, I explained to him kind of the uh, uh, the history uh, of our involvement with the uh, center of the universe and the DAO, uh, and uh, and also who I what my position was and wasn't in in the RASC, and indicated that you know obviously. If they were interested in this, uh, they should be talking uh, to the uh, Victoria Center. And Bob McDonald is, uh, I think, as most people uh, know, is is quite involved with the friends of the DAO, and so we uh, we discussed that. And uh, anyway, um, uh, what I'm going to propose to do is is I wanted to raise this that they, they sound like they're serious about proceeding with this. Um, but, uh, you know, this will obviously have to be discussed uh, by the Victoria Center Council. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, our, our involvement would, uh, would proceed out of that. Now, there, uh, what I'm showing here is a couple of things from their website. Um, MMBC, mmbc.bc.ca, and uh, these are concept plans. Uh, a, a lot of things, most things are not really set in concrete, uh, shall we say. Um, uh, a, lot, a lot of things have yet to be decided, you know, they have to do a lot of fundraising and various other things. But uh, anyway, I'm just, uh, bring this up uh, and uh, so that you can start to think about it. Uh, there are a number of possibilities, including uh, perhaps dedicated space for the, for the Victoria Center, should we want it. Um, 
but uh, you know, there's still a, a long way to go before this. Uh, it has been recently announced that this plan to uh, locate in, in Langford is, uh, is, is proceeding and there has been some controversy about it because of the, the, uh, the, the placement, uh, uh, previous placement of the uh, museum on uh, Bastion Square in Victoria. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we certainly talked about that as well, but it's simply a situation where there does not seem to be much interest in Victoria about uh, these sorts of facilities. You know, the, the uh, art gallery wanted to move downtown, but that's not happening. Uh, they tried uh, a, a number of ideas to uh, resurrect their, their old spot in Bastion Square, and that doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And of course, a lot of things are happening on the West Shore. So, so anyway, um, I think I will leave it there. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure I can answer your detailed questions, but I, I think uh, 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 oh, those on the, the center should think about it, and, and the membership should think about it, wh about whether uh, uh, they're interested in uh, in being involved in. Uh, in, in something like this, perhaps uh, doing uh, 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 sidewalk astronomy here, taking part in whatever programs they might set up. Uh, Bob McDonald uh, uh, was quite interested in this tower uh, feature and suggested that that might be a great site to, uh, to set up a telescope. But anyway, um, you know, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, kind of premature to get into a lot of details uh, like this. Uh, I think the, the last thing I should say is that, you know, they, uh, Mr. Leverton, you know, said that, you know, this does not, you know, he does not want to be in competition or having differences in any way with, uh, with the folks at the FDAO and the, the, the DAO. So, um, Anyway, I will leave it there. Uh, Chris, I have a question. Yes. Can you remind me, who is the MLA in the Langford area? Uh, I think it's, it's uh, John, um, starts with an H. I think it's, uh, it's Horgan. Oh. Uh, uh, but they, I think, uh, I think they are also looking uh, a lot at, at at the uh at the at the federal direction uh, i think uh you know they're they're hoping that that this facility would be kind of seen as a national thing including kind of the 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 uh space and astronomy related uh, uh part of it but uh right now things are are very vague you know and you know just off the top of my head, I can't sort of think of something that they could set up there and say, hey, this is kind of a national level uh, facility. But I actually heard more talk from him about uh, kind of national stuff than provincial stuff. Interesting. Thank you. Perhaps they could uh, build a train from downtown Victoria to Langford. <laughs> now there's an idea. <laughs> That's right. Well, this this whole facility, you, you look through it, and I think there's a, like a big, uh, you know, auditorium in there, kind of a performing arts center. Uh, I think there's also, to help kind of pay the bills, I think there's also a com commercial component to it. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what finally comes, comes out of it, because they're, they're still kind of in the the dreaming stage a little bit, like they're trying to get it into um, actually bending metal. She's going hunting. Great. Gary, did you have something you wanted to ask Chris? Was that? And you're muted. <laughs> Gary, you're muted. Oh, sorry about that. I'm uncharacteristically muted. Usually I don't do that, but um, Chris, 
uh, in Arizona, I was friends with a guy named Bob Gent or Gent. Does that name ring a bell to you? Uh, not off the top of my head, no. Okay, so here's the scoop. He's a re he was a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, and he was a, a space systems officer. He was in charge of uh, the military satellites uh, that would be peeking down at the Earth, and he was the head guy. So one day at dinner, I asked him, Bob, can you deny that there's Hubble telescopes circling the Earth, pointing at the uh, circling the Earth, pointing at the Earth instead of pointing out away from the Earth? And he said, "No, I cannot." Do you have any comment about that? Well, you know, uh, uh, I discuss that matter in my book, and uh, the generation of uh, spacecraft uh, reconnaissance satellites that that Hubble is supposed to uh, resemble um, are still classified. The details are around that. The, the satellites that have been declassified are the previous generations where they had used photographic film and, and <laughs> dropped, the, dropped the film and was picked up by aircraft. The digital ones are still all classified. Um, and so, uh, uh, and the major maker of those spacecraft was uh, Lockheed, and that happens to be uh, who, the, the same outfit that made uh, Hubble. So uh, uh, I think I think there are uh, are some differences. It's it's not quite as simple as just you know pointing it down rather than up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I I suspect there would be a lot of uh, resemblances and. You know, the uh, those those satellites were were being designed to sort of fit into the payload bay of the shuttle. Although, actually, I think most of them wound up being launched on on top of uh, expendable rockets. And and so was Hubble. Like it fits Hubble fit very snugly inside the payload bay. And I so I suspect that that there there would be. Uh, uh, a resemblance. Um, just a little sidelight is, you know, we, we have uh, JWST coming up and then after that we have what's just been W first, which has just been recently named after Nancy, uh, Nancy Roman, who was the first, uh, first in-house astronomer at NASA, uh, the, the Nancy Roman Space Telescope. And it actually started out as a uh, as a national reconnaissance office uh, reconnaissance satellite, um, and they've actually they're converting it to a space telescope. Um, but it's actually quite uh, quite a different thing from your mainline reconnaissance satellite. So it's it it's not uh, it, it's. Uh, uh, not really similar to Hubble, perhaps a, a kissing cousin, but I think it's a different design, I think a different manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. Interesting question. Very good. Um, any follow up to that, or shall we ask David to proceed? I think, David, you may proceed. Okay. Uh, again, for those of you who aren't on the Rask Vic list, uh, David has uh, circulated a photograph he took, which he's going to show us tonight and talk a little bit about the equipment used in doing that. Okay, so every, everybody see the PowerPoint, I hope. Um, <clears throat> so feel free to kind of interrupt me uh, if you wish, um, if you have any questions. Um, so basically, uh, I came up with this idea uh, during the pandemic to uh, maybe build something which is kind of an equivalent to a grab-and-go scope. So most of us are familiar with that. We, we don't always bring out the big guns uh, unless it's worthwhile doing. Um, for myself, I have a larger mount and I have a larger refractor, but it uh, rarely pays me to pull it out because it takes about half an hour to set it up and a half an hour to break it down. So for those of us uh, who don't have permanent setups, uh, this, all, this thought always uh, kind of crosses your mind that you should have something that's grab and go. So I took that to the same extent with uh, 
uh, imaging. Uh, now, I have in the past uh, uh, used uh, lightweight trackers. Um, uh, you can probably see, uh, I've done this kind of stuff before uh, with uh, digital SLRs as well, but this one is actually first light for the rig that I'm gonna talk about tonight. So um, I actually discovered since I published this image that uh, there are certainly mistakes in the configuration and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, not only did I not do calibration frames uh, for this image, uh, I also had it misconfigured optically. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So how did this start? Well, um, I've done a lot of this kind of stuff and there, the four considerations that I've always felt that were necessary for me was size and weight of components. I don't know how many of you complain about the heavy weight of your mounts. Uh, portability because you want to make it worthwhile because we only have a few fleeting nights of good weather here on the west coast. Uh, and also uh, light pollution and um, I've all often wondered about what uh, the LED lighting would do to us. So I did uh, a little bit of investigation into that as well. So uh, this is my attempt at a grab and go imaging setup. So I wanted to retain the use of my lightweight tracking mount. I've had pretty good luck with using the Star Adventure and also uh, quite an ancient uh, Astro track. Um, but now we really have the benefit of uh, better lightweight optics, which I'm gonna talk about, and also some tremendous uh, leaps and bounds with uh, one-shot color CMOS imagers, and also some improvements in light pollution filtration as well. So lightweight uh, tracking mount, uh, certainly a lot of uh, choice today. Uh, I think uh, in the early days, uh, there was a uh, Vixen Polari and uh, uh, the AstroTrack, I think a, a couple of us have owned AstroTracks. Uh, I still use mine. Um, different levels of stability and accuracy, and, uh, uh, but some of them have auto guiding capability as well, and the AstroTrack does, and so does the Star Adventure. Now, most of them are uh, of uh, traditional design. Uh, you can see the AstroTrack on the left-hand side. Uh, it's a very unorthodox looking um, uh, tracking mount but really based on a very uh, sophisticated version of what we call the barn door mount. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been in astronomy long enough to remember barn doors, but uh, barn doors were essentially just two pieces of wood that were uh, hinged to the other. And, uh, and a, a screw was actually, a pivoting screw was put in between the two pieces to allow um, uh, the, the movement uh, or the spreading of the two uh, pieces of wood apart and you would have a ball head on one side and then uh, what was equivalent to a tangential screw that would be sort of a splayed apart by, by a motor, often uh, something that was cannibalized from a floppy drive or something like that, anything that would have a stuffing motor in it. So I don't know how many people in the audience have built one of those or, or actually used one. Uh, there were even versions where people just manually uh, turned a little thumb screw to advance the separation of the two pieces of wood. So the AstroTrack is just kind of a super sophisticated version of that. It costs a lot more than two pieces of wood, unfortunately, uh, but it has a microprocessor and a very uh, uh, precision uh, machined uh, screw, which is uh, spread apart and uh, basically the same principle. Now the Star Adventure is a little bit different. Star Adventure is uh, kind of a traditional uh, kind of German equatorial mount in natural fact, except it's missing the deck motor. It only has the RA motor. So for those of you who do uh, photography, you, you'll, re you'll know that you don't really need the deck. Uh, the deck is really required for taking care of um, uh, uh, deviations from uh, having your polar, uh, polar alignment uh, slightly off, or it could have to do with flexure and different things. But we really depend a lot on, these tracking motors depend a lot on accurate polar alignment, and then you're only just using the RA or the, or the right ascension movement. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, both my mounts actually have auto guiding capability, so they're capable of adjusting the RA, RA speed if, if necessary. So uh, one thing that I've noticed uh, lately that I've been really 
a lot of better lightweight optics coming out. Now these are purpose built for astronomy. Uh, you can certainly use photographic lenses, especially if you have really good lenses. And I do own a lot of uh, fairly good uh, photographic lenses. Uh, but the benefit of going with these lightweight optics that are available now is that they're purpose built for astronomy. So in other words, they actually have the right fittings at the back. Uh, they have the ability to apply filters easily to it. Um, a lot of them have um, a Lotus version glass. Uh, the Borg that I'm gonna talk about tonight has a, a fluorite element at the front. Uh, it also has a built-in uh, built flattener. Uh, now the weight is really important for these lightweight mounts. I think uh, anybody who's attempted, and myself included, attempted really heavy borderline configurations realize that tracking is really bad if you do that. And it really depends on a lot of good, uh, good balance and, and staying within the limits. And in fact, I try to stay within 50% of the load capacities. So here, here's some examples of uh, these lightweight optics. Uh, there's the Borg that I actually have that I'm gonna be talking tonight. It's on the left-hand side. And then the right-hand side has some, uh, I would say, I, I, I wish I had maybe looked into the William Optics uh, solution earlier, but I had a bit of an affiliation with Borg. I've owned uh, some Borg components for quite a while and uh, I was quite interested in, in looking at the Borg. Uh, but a much cheaper solution is actually the William Optics uh, Red Cat. Um, I think an, a lot of people have uh, started buying the Red Cat. Uh, there's actually already uh, uh, an enhanced version of the Red Cat called the Space Cat, and it, it's black rather than being red. Now, the thing that's common about all these uh, lightweight optics is that they're typically very short. Um, uh, 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 focal length uh, uh, configurations. Uh, my Borg uh, with the flattener is only 200 millimeters and the the Red Cat I think is like 250. Uh, it's only an f4 though, uh, no a 4.5 or something like that. Uh, it's, it's not as fast as the Borg. So the other thing is uh, one shot CMOS. Now you can certainly go the proper quote the proper route and buy a mono uh, system, but then you're into filters and uh, the extra expense of that. Um, also, uh, you're into more uh, potentially more automation that you need to do in order to get through all the filter uh, filters. So I, I chose for the grab and go imager. I, I chose a one shot uh, color. And the other the other thing I, I did was I, I picked uh, an imager that had small pixels. Now, again, this is really counter to what most people do. Uh, you wanna buy big pixels for a camera typically because of sensitivity. And uh, typically you're working with longer focal lengths. Uh, if you're using the VCO scope, it's got a long focal length. So you wouldn't necessarily want the small pixels that I have in this camera, but it's perfect for short focal lengths. So that's why I went with this uh, imager. So this is the imager I'm talking about. This is the uh, ESI 183MC. So this is the one shot color. Uh, it's 20 megapixels uh, with 2.4 megapixel of, of micron pixels. So the, the typical CCD uh, really, uh, I have another one that I own. It's almost five micron. And then I have one that's actually eight micron. So the, the old school uh, cameras were well, probably around eight microns in size, some of them even going up to 12. Uh, this one uh, being CMOS, it's uh, using a, a production technology that is much cheaper to produce. Uh, there's less um, discards from CMOS uh, production than with CCD. Uh, CCD is an uh, kind of an expensive technology. Uh, it uh, has a greater bit depth uh, for a time, but the CMOS is catching up. And uh, it, in theory, has less noise and deeper uh, well. And uh, this one's still not too bad, as you can see. Um, it's definitely an improvement on a digital SLR because of the fact that it has cooling. So you can probably see in the center image uh, this, uh, this fan. Um, this can go down to, I think, minus 35 centigrade uh, from ambient. So I don't have mine chilling too, too far. Um, but uh, it typically, you probably would take it down to like minus 20 or something like that. And that really reduces your, uh, your noise. 
So the other thing I looked into was light pollution filters. Um, I was a little bit worried about the fact that uh, light pollution filters from a couple of decades ago, they were really designed to get uh, rid of uh, or notch out the uh, illumination from uh, high pressure sodium, uh, low pressure sodium, and, and um, uh, they, they uh, were notched in a very specific way. Now, I was th thinking that I would basically have to throw these away now. Uh, now, I don't have to throw them away uh, with the impending encroach of uh, LED. Uh, there actually is another opportunity now. Um, there are now uh, versions of the filter. In fact, uh, the one that I chose for this rig is uh, is an IDAS filter as well, but it's called the Night Glow Suppression Filter. So it actually has a notch now, uh, actually for LED. So you can see here, this section here uh, drops out and uh, kind of takes care of uh, uh, LED. Uh, uh, some LED illumination, not all of it. And uh, then of course it does the traditional uh, notches for uh, other things as well. Uh, so, oops, just lost my mouse here. Let's see if I can get back here. So there, there's lots of different choices here. I, I noticed that uh, Dan Posey has been using um, uh, nebula uh, based uh, kind of notchings for some of his. Um, actually, I think this might actually be wrong, actually. I'm just looking at this graph. It doesn't look quite right. Um, this may have been labeled wrong. Uh, but anyways, uh, you can get the idea with these light pollution filters. Basically, you're notching out the wavelengths that you don't want. So uh, they do exist. Uh, I'm using this Night Glow, and they also have a D2 now, which uh, notches out LED as well. So here, here's the configuration. So um, uh, you can see the, uh, my optical rig at the top. It's riding on top of a ball head uh, on top of the Astro track, uh, which sits on the wedge and sits on the, the tripod. Uh, I've actually decided to standardize on one tripod now. So uh, you can see that I've got a, a, a small clamp at the bottom here, which holds the wedge. Uh, I actually replaced that with my new, uh, Alt azimuth uh, uh, viewing mount now. So now I have one tripod that sits near the door and then I either grab my imaging rig, my grab and go imaging rig, or I grab my grab and go uh, refractor uh, for uh, ob observing. So you can see here that uh, I've got a total weight of uh, less than 20 pounds. So basically this, this can be set up inside and I can just grab it and take it out on, onto the driveway. Um, if I was to use a digital SLR, there's not a lot of difference. I, I actually thought I would see a bigger difference, but the optical trains are about the same. Uh, they're about the same weight. Now, the big difference is when I compare this with my uh, Lozmandy mount, which weighs a lot more. So I'm actually working with uh, uh, the 20 pounds that I already mentioned versus the 40 plus pounds. So definitely better for me. So the other refinement that I'm hoping to do is uh, hoping to get rid of the uh, laptop uh, with this uh, Linux-based uh, 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 ASI Air Pro. Now it's about the size of, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Raspberry Pis, but it's basically a Raspberry Pi 4 uh, running uh, the Linux system uh, using um, uh, a, a set of modules which are based on the Indy standard as opposed to the ASCOM standard. Now ASCOM is what most of us are familiar with, but this one runs on Indy. Now the ASI Pro is quite small, as you can see. It runs off at 12 volts now, so it's pretty standard for the kind of stuff that we use. Uh, but it is very specific to the ASI devices. So uh, there is um, uh, an alternative. There's something called StellarMate, uh, which you can actually put on a Raspberry Pi, but you'll have to roll your own on this one. Um, you'll have to do the installation yourself. You, you can just turn it on and away you go. Uh, you can actually address it using your Android or iOS uh, phone or tablet and uh, basically do uh, polar alignment, auto guiding and image capture all rolled into one. Uh, you can attach a little USB key to one of the USB ports on this device and basically you can capture 64 gig or, or maybe even 120 gig of uh, storage for your for your images. 
So some caveats, um, uh, my system has no go-to. So you have to have a basic understanding of the night sky. And uh, usually it requires a little bit of planning. I have to do a little bit of star hopping and uh, uh, figure out how I'm gonna find the objects. Uh, I also have a little small refractor on the side that I actually, I take, uh, it mounts using the same uh, mounting bracket. So I can basically find it with the other refractor and then mount the imaging setup. So they pretty well point in the same place after that. Um, it's also really for wide field, deep sky. Uh, smaller objects, you probably wouldn't want to use this rig. So here's some examples of the kind of things that you can do. Uh, you can photograph the California nebula quite nicely. You can do the elephant trunk, uh, heart nebula, horse head, and of course, uh, M42, so this guy. Okay, so um, I'm open to questions. Uh, anybody have any questions about uh, what I have here or what I've shown you? The uh, ASI gizmo that you use to do the actual controlling of the imaging, mm -hmm. um, is that just app-based? Like there's no desktop interface at all or? Uh, it, it is a full interface. Um, I wish I could show you. It's it's actually a captive program. At first, I was a little bit worried about their security, but uh, I realize now that their program is actually captive. Um, you're not gonna. Somebody would have to hack the whole system to to get in. Uh, it also has very uh, small. Um, uh, re, uh, it radiates the Wi-Fi really uh, tightly. So if you're not within a, I don't know, within about 10 feet, maybe even within five feet, you're probably not even gonna be able to connect to it. Uh, Raspberry Pis are notorious for that. Uh, this thing is embedded in an aluminum case. So that makes the Wi-Fi even worse. But, but that, that, that's good, you know, from the point of view of security, that's good. Um, you can um, uh, just tap into it through any phone, uh, Android, iOS, or use an iPad. But but you don't get so, so you, don't, you don't get the you don't get the Linux system you don't get a, a Linux desktop you just get the app. Okay, so you're you're not using Bluetooth. You're using Wi-Fi for the connection. You're using to Wi-Fi a, to yeah. a specific app on your on your smart device. Yeah. So what 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 happens is um, I don't know. We, uh, many of you may have cameras that do this. Uh, you can turn on a Wi-Fi transmitter on your camera, for instance and then uh, look for it in, in your, uh, when you scan for uh, devices, you can look for it, it's exactly the same. So you'll see the ASI Air pop up and then you just choose it. And then you go to their app that you download and then it'll connect up. It's pretty simple Thanks. actually. Yeah, good. David, John McDonald here. A comment hey, and a question. Comment is a nice picture. Oh, thank you. And oh, question, oh, I should. Well, after after your uh, your question, I, I've got a comment about the picture actually. Yeah, you said that you some things went wrong, but it's still a nice yes, picture. Yes, whatever. Yes, some doing. things went wrong, and I'm gonna bring up another picture here. Mm -hmm. Just a second here. Okay, I'm going to share the diagram here. Okay, did everybody see that? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, there's a bit of uh, planning here when you build this. Um, it, this is not something you pull out of a box and assemble. Uh, because I bought the parts or I got the parts from different areas, uh, there's a little bit of configuration. 
So everything leading up to, uh, this is all Borg up to this point right here. And this is the back of the flattener. Everything beyond has to be configured. So you have, um, you have about, uh, they talk about having 60 millimeters of back focus. Um, a very common figure is 55 millimeters. That's often used for using cameras for back focus. Uh, this particular system uh, of uh, optics requires 60 millimeters of back focus. Now, I also had to add in the fact that, um, I, I, I actually didn't know this, but filters apparently uh, uh, push the back focus out a little bit. So you have to take a third of the thickness of the filter so a third of the thickness of the IDAS filter is 0.825 millimeters. So I have to add that into the back focus. So you end up having to get uh, a series of spacers that have to go from, from the back here. And I've got a bunch of them. I've got these little stellar view spacers. I've even got a variable spacer that I had to adjust to get to the right size. And I even had a Delrin spacer that I had to stick in here. Uh, you have to sort of accommodate this filter. Anyways, to make a long story short, nice diagram, I go to assemble it and I leave one of the spacers out. So before first light, uh, the image that you see is off by five millimeters. Now this is quite interesting because this is a, for a first light, this is very inept because not only did I not get calibration frames, uh, I missed uh, I missed the configuration of the spacing as well. So maybe this is as bad as it gets. And I think what I feel good about is with even with as bad as it gets, it didn't come out too badly. So uh, I, I, I think the tolerances are such that I'm hoping for even much better results once everything is right. David, don't beat yourself up too much. These, <laughs> things, these things never work. I know. <laughs> Even the third time they don't work, so don't worry about it. Yeah. And then, no. then of course, there's the infamous uh, Borg configuration diagrams, which uh, Borg, oh, is, they don't Borg, is, Borg is well named because it is a series of components which can transform mm -hmm. optics into whatever you want. I don't know if you... you I don't know if you can see the lines in this uh, <laughs> photograph, but every part that has a line here comes apart. It's a so component. It, it's a component. So there, the focuser here is a separate little piece that actually sits into a tiny little tube, which sits into another piece, which is the rotating ring. And then tucked inside of this is the flattener. It's quite a large flattener. It, it runs from here to about here to the back of the focuser. So there's the element here. In fact, the element, this is actually a hood. This is the element. This is the fluorite element right at the front here. And then the, the flattener is right directly behind it. So yeah, it takes a bit, a bit of configuration though, but I'm, I am quite happy. Uh, I do have that grab and go uh, configuration now. So I'm pleased. Congratulations. You can be a consultant. Very pretty. <laughs> yeah. I I just checked OPG. It's uh, fifteen seventy five USD, which is twenty one hundred bucks plus tax. So. It's not cheap. Uh, I I would I would really encourage people if you want to build something similar, uh, look at the Red Cat and the Space Cat. Much better value. Um, you can get it from back east. I think for well, actually they might be rising in price as well, but I think it was just a little over a thousand actually for the optics, and it's got everything this has. Uh, and, and actually more, actually. It's got a built-in Batonoff mask. Uh, it's got the road hater too, as well. Uh, yeah, it, it's a nice scope and I, I've seen results from it. And I think if it wasn't for the fact that I already owned a Borg, I might have gone Red Cat. It would match the camera as well. It's red. <laughs> Very important though. Yes. <laughs> David, I've got a question about the helical focuser. Is that a very stiff arrangement? So there's going to be no shifting of image uh, uh, if you go up to the zenith uh, and the weight of the camera. That is. Uh, yeah, it it actually has nylon um, uh, little pins in it. Uh, so once you get the focus, you can actually lock it in if you want. Uh, but I don't anticipate 
I don't anticipate that problem. Uh, I unfortunately, within the the first day, strip the threads on the nylon. <laughs> Do not tight over tighten the, the those nylon things on the Borg. I, I haven't got replacements yet for it yet, but uh, but yeah, there's a way of uh, sort of locking it down. Uh, there's also gaffer tape too. <laughs> so, any more were, questions were, for David? Yeah, were there any other questions? Okay, if there's no other questions, uh, you can certainly drop me a line if you're thinking about doing it, or if you have some questions about the the one shot color. I I, I really like the 183. I I know there were a lot of uh, complaints about the amp glow, but uh, I I didn't really see a lot. Uh, I guess I'm not exposing it long enough yet to see it. And once I have the calibration frames in, I don't think it's gonna be a problem anyways. Mm -hmm. I think somebody else has one. I think Doug McDonald has a 183 as well. And I, I wasn't, yes? Uh, how long can you track with that Astro Tracker and this sort of rig are you? Okay, then... so, so, so without any auto guiding, I could probably do about two minutes. Uh, but I've also got an auto guider. So I, this, this is in keeping with the, the miniature theme. Um, this is uh, a 290, uh, which um, is probably overkill for guiding. But this piece here is the guide scope. So it's tiny. Mind you, it's, it's only 30 millimeters. It's, it's really, really small. But because the 290 has really small pixels as well, you don't need anything bigger than that. Not, not for guiding 200 millimeters. So I've got another little guy. Michael was, I think Michael was asking about the tracking capability of the AstroTrack, and that's two hours. Oh, oh, you mean the length of time? Yes, yeah. yes. Oh, that's another annoying thing about the AstroTrack. By the time you get everything set up, you don't have much time to track, and then you got to reset it again. So it's not like a German equatorial mount. Actually, I thought I actually was thinking about an individual exposure, but uh, besides, after two hours, you're frozen to death in this climate. So that's true. Uh, unless you're operating it with the ASI Air and you've got GoTo, uh, this is not the system for that. Th this forces you to be outside, which uh, I, I kind of like. That, that two-hour limit is pretty common for a uh, tangent arm drive. Yes, After that your tangent arm gets too long and the accuracy goes all to hell. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a, a cord. Uh, I, I mean, it's basically a straight line. It's yeah. supposed to it's supposed to be a cord, right? I mean, it's it, it's supposed to be circular, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, and the microprocessor does does do on the AstroTrack does adjust for position. It does. Uh, so it, does uh, it, do it, it it actually is intelligent. Uh, I I understand that. It speeds up and uh, slows yeah. down uh, at specific spots. Yeah, we we did. My friend Roman programmed the chip for that when we built the kit scopes in Edmonton. It's a short little uh, tangent arm drive, and he programmed the, the steps, which was quite interesting to get it in the small chip he had. Yeah. I built a dual arm plywood one that I still have, mm. <laughs> and it, it's okay for about an hour bef before it starts to go wonky. Yeah, there, there's actually, a, I know they don't make the AstroTrack anymore, and then then the company came out with this really weird uh, contraption, which I don't know if anybody's bought one, mm -hmm. um, but it's horrendously expensive. I wouldn't buy it. Um, but there's another company called Fornax, and uh, they've done something kind of similar. It's just kind of like a chunky version of the AstroTrack. Not as elegant as far as I'm concerned, but uh, it's supposed to be okay, too. AstroTrack Astro actually um, machined these things beautifully. I think that's why. Oh, they're they're they're, be they're beautiful, beautiful actually. Yeah, I have the original that doesn't have the um, the machining of the uh, the holes to make it light, and it, it's uh, it's like a tank, right? I mean, they built really really well. That's the one I have. I think I I was the first one to order one. You were you were. I kind of <laughs> scratched my head, Joe, but I, I I take it all back now. Mm -hmm. I still use it. Yeah, it's good. I mean, if you if you're not greedy about the exposure, uh, it's it's an excellent uh, tracker. Anyways, thank you. Well, thank you, David. Um, Alex, did you uh, have something you wanted to say? 
Can you hear me now? We can. Okay, it's in a reference to the by-election and I need signatures from people who live in Victoria because I'm running for a council again. Okay, so anybody who lives in Victoria who would like to help nominate Alex, please, uh, I guess, email you. Is that the best way, Alex? Yeah, sure. Okay. I think that would be best. Thank you. Yeah. And good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Dave, you had a late-breaking thing from Edmonton, I believe. Uh, just just uh, here, I'll, I'll share the screen here. Um, two things, actually. Uh, so, so the first one is if you got get the Roy, regular Royal Astronomical Society email, uh, you got a, a photograph that's at the header of it that was taken by my friend Luca. Uh, and it's uh, the sunset that goes, he's, he's done this image blending thing at different times. And there's a really nice description of what he's done down further in the email here as to how he's uh, done it so that you get the capture from early sunset through twilight through darkness. Uh, quite, he's quite adept at that sort of stuff. The other image is this one from uh, Alistair. He was just... He was out helping, helping a new uh, uh, newbie in, uh, in working out his scope. And uh, he set up his, uh, his uh, Canon Mark III, uh, 5D Mark III, uh, with a, uh, I got it here. It's got a, a 70 millimeter lens, uh, ASA 1600, shot at f6.3, 20 uh, 60 second exposures. And he was trying to find uh, the comet Benson 2020Q1. And I can't figure out where that is in here. He says he has to shoot some more to get exactly where it is. He says it's just a little fuzzy bit. But what he's got in here is uh, down here in Sagitta, that is M71. Um, there's the dumbbell. And then there's Alberio. And down here is the coat hanger. So not bad for doing a quickie little image while he was helping somebody else get their telescope set up. <laughs> so that's, that's it for me. Thank you so much. So Reg, over to you, El Presidente. Okay, uh, have I, can you hear me? I've, we I've can. Muted. <laughs> Okay, first of all, thanks, David, for a, a, a beautiful uh, presentation. There's a really nice slideshow there. Uh, and it's really neat, these little scopes like you've got there. I found it very interesting. And Dave, thanks for uh, uh, coming in at the last minute with some Edmonton stuff. I appreciate that. Um, I think that uh, I'm going to attempt a screenshot since we were recently talking about um, uh, telescopes, uh, just the latest breaking news about our optical guidance system. Uh, system, uh, And I will try and get a slideshow going here. Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay, so uh, this is the back plane of the uh, OGS 12.5 uh, inch RC. And you notice there's no focuser there. So this was a challenge for us. And so John McDonald kindly loaded uh, this uh, particular uh, device here, which was uh, uh, Williams Optics uh, focuser. And uh, we adapted that. Uh oh, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, uh, this is the uh, Bakshi uh, focusing device that we used for that. And uh, so we, uh, as you know, that we now have the system on the uh, mount. And John McDonald took uh, a nice picture. This one is of Deneb. And uh, I was really excited by it, but some people with more uh, sharper eyes and, and uh, more experience uh, had some concerns with it and thought it could work better. And so what we thought was that the Bakshi focuser might not be coaxial with the optical axis of the 
the uh, optical guidance system telescope. So uh, we've been hunting around for a focuser and as the guys spilled the beans earlier, um, th this uh, helical focuser uh, was, uh, I guess Bruno had it in his uh, stores. And the, the beautiful thing is, is that the, the threads of this match the threads of that, hopefully. Is that, are you pretty confident in that, John? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Good we'll, stuff. we'll see, but I'm pretty sure. So at any rate, I'm really, uh, really pumped about this. I, uh, the one concern I have is that the length of the system when it's uh, compressed might be uh, a little bit too long to use a two inch diagonal for eyepiece work. Or maybe it'll work with a 1.5, a 1.5 one and a quarter inch diagonal instead for, for eyepiece work. But it should be really a good way for us to test the camera out to see this should be a lot more uh, coaxial than uh, the Bakshi system. So that will give us a, a great opportunity to uh, evaluate the scope uh, with a modest investment. So I, I'm really kind of stoked about this. So uh, watch this space. And uh, with that, I'll how do I get out? I'll stop the share here. And then we, I will share the screen again, but this time with uh, this, this thing here. And um, what I'm going to do is go here. This is our web page uh, uh, for tonight. Uh, one thing is if people have not heard Karun Thanjavar's uh, talk about uh, deep machine learning and neural nets, uh, it's a particularly frightening <laughs> talk. And I know I had to have therapy after I, I heard him give this presentation at one of our meetings. At any rate, uh, you can join them uh, at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday. He's going to be reprising the talk, and, and here's his abstract about it. And it's getting more and more uh, relevant, the power and intrusive uh, nature of artificial intelligence. And he's, uh, if you haven't seen his talk, he showed some very simple little demonstrations that just blew me away uh, how quickly it was able to learn from uh, experience. And then there's another interesting talk that Jim Hesser uh, alerted me to, how to talk to a science denier that uh, Jim heard when he attended a recent uh, physics colloquium. And the author uh, here uh, has uh, written a book about it. And Jim reports that uh, the, the the key takeaway message was that the best way he found to help a science denier is through real conversation that leads to building a relationship of trust between the denier and the scientist. And so if you want to read it, there's a nice Newsweek uh, article on that. And then I, I, I was, uh, uh, I didn't know if David was going to mention his uh, beautiful picture, but I, I was really impressed with this. And uh, so I just threw that in there as well. And then, of course, I've been scooped by um, our guys in, uh, in uh, Edmonton. Uh, uh, Dave uh, Robinson, do you know what the temperature is in Edmonton right now? I, I heard rumors it was about minus, thir uh, minus 20 or something like that. It was not good. At any rate, it might be warming up now with the weather system moving into that area. But... Um, at any rate, there's Luca's picture. Um, and then other offerings from RAST this week. Um, we have uh, the uh, robotic uh, telescope image contest. It's the Veil Nebula. And uh, so that might be something you'd like to play around with. And then uh, the earlier this afternoon, they had uh, a historical committee on Mars through the eyes of RAST. And that was uh, night kindly promoted by Bill Weir. Bill, did you catch that talk? I did. What, do you, uh, if it's going to be uh, on the web, was that worthwhile seeing? 
It was interesting. Um, I think it'll be probably put up on YouTube, but I'm not really sure. Usually those speaker things end up on YouTube, on the RESC YouTube channel. Okay, that, that seemed like uh, with all of our interest in Mars right now, that would be kind of fun to capture. Uh, then there's on Wednesday uh, in Toronto, they have a talk on hunting monsters in the infant cosmos. And uh, then on Thursday, we have winter observing uh, session. I think it's the, the wrap up of the Explore the Universe series. So that is available. And on Friday and Saturday, there's some sort of virtual Halloween Zoom parties uh, at, in Montreal and in Toronto. So a lot of active stuff. And as mentioned before, um, by uh, Dave, a, a really nice write-up on how Luca did his beautiful picture here. So the other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, I think it was earlier today that uh, Starlink launched another set of uh, satellites, and they've been very busy this this month. Uh, from October 6th to the 18th to the 24th, they've launched 180 satellites into the sky. And I worked it out, and it's approximately 895 satellites they've got up there now. So uh, this is uh, kind of scary stuff, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, and the other thing I have here is the imagery of the forecast for the weather. And it looks like we're going to have fairly lousy weather here. I'm just going back. Um, but we've got a frontal system that's just to the north of us and high level debris from that will probably mess up good uh, viewing opportunities in our area for a while. But as we go forward, these are six hour uh, images of weather systems coming through. We've got a fairly major uh, active frontal system moving through early on Friday and then a ridge building in and maybe Late Friday, we might have uh, some clear skies, uh, but with clear skies and light winds because the pressure gradient's low, be good for fog formation. But uh, if we wanted to test out that helical focuser, uh, that might be a date to, uh, to uh, check it out at the VCO. And with that, I'll stop the share and turn it back to you guys. For Andrew's sake, it was two degrees in Edmonton tonight, 60% chance of snow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> October. <laughs> yeah. Great. Any questions for Reg or anybody else who spoke earlier? Any uh, or any final or any final announcements? I guess we're uh, at about an end for this evening. But uh, I I have a couple of things uh, just eye candy I could share. Sure, that'd be great. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I know not everyone uh, frequents uh, Facebook, so I just thought I would share a couple of images that our members have posted on our Facebook page. And Doug, Doug McDonald has just imaged M45, um, the Pleiades, and uh, so this is his little write-up on it. And I'll just enlarge it so you can see it a bit better. He got a lot of really nice striations in the... Uh, in the reflections. That's beautiful. Yeah, really nice. That's a, he has a new scope, William Optics Z73. I'm not familiar with it, but it's oh. a fairly, yeah, it's just a nice, nice refractor. And um, Brock Johnson, who I don't really know, but he uh, sure got a nice image of dumbbell. He's uh, experimenting, obviously, with infrared filters and that sort of thing. So he did really a really good job. That's about it. I uh, just thought I would share those two things with you. 
maybe I'll just mention too that uh, Doug McDonald reached out to uh, me earlier today to say that he's got a, a camera for sale. I guess he's got some new equipment. So uh, keep your eye on the buy and sell. I yes, I would urge people to look on the buy and sell on our website because uh, we do post new stuff and there's uh, there's a new posting on there already, even without Doug's um, material. And maybe in lieu of, um, I don't know, because uh, you know we, we can't have an in-person sale obviously this year, but maybe in lieu of that, if you have um, spare gear that uh, you'd like to rehouse, um, this may be a time that maybe that's the place to do it. We could highlight that at a coming Astro Cafe if people want to. Sure, I can organize even something. Yeah, I can even review other online ways of of selling. Yeah, Astro Gear. If you want, we can do that all at the same time. Just that's been kind of a fun event, which unfortunately we can't do in person. Yeah. Anybody else have anything for this evening? Uh, thanks for hosting. Uh, appreciate that, uh, Chris. Oh, well, you're very welcome. Oh, and just uh, if you didn't see the chat, Chris Gaynor uh, indicated the web page um, where you can see the uh, information about the proposal for the Maritime Center in Langford. Uh, it's mmmbc.bc.ca. I have the, the slides there if you're interested in seeing more. Anyways, well, I hope everybody has an enjoyable week and a safe Halloween and all that. And we're scheduled to be back here next week which uh, incredible to think is November. So uh, anyways, and with the news today, I guess uh, the chance of getting together in anything bigger than a group of six is not going to happen anytime soon. Anyway, so luckily we live on Vancouver Island and most of us are on Vancouver Island at the moment. So that's uh, probably a good thing. Anyways, take care everyone. And uh, if there's no final comments, we'll call it an evening. Thanks very much. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. Take care, Bye. everyone.